everybody. Welcome to the Military Spouse Book Club. How's everybody doing tonight? So excited! Yay! People time, adult time, no work time. Um, okay, so today we are going to be um, having, we actually, I have a, I have a, we're going to be a trifecta of awesome today because I have Corey Weathers, who is the author of um, Sacred Spaces, which is the book we're going to be talking about today. So yes, so Corey wrote um, Sacred Spaces, A Journey to the Heart of Military Marriage, um, which not many people really want to journey to because sometimes it can be a scary place, but she touches on places that, that we really need to and don't always really want to acknowledge. So it's an awesome book. I can't wait to, uh, can't wait to discuss it. Um, so yes, so we have Corey who again is the author and she is the Military Spouse of the Year, the Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year for 2015. And we are also hosting with Natasha Harth, who is this year's the 2016 uh, Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year as well. So woo woo on that one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna allow, um, I'm gonna let Natasha introduce herself. And then I'm going to let uh, Corey introduce herself and then tell us a little bit about um, her book. So, Natasha, if you would. All right, there we go, microphone. <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Natasha, in case you didn't know. I am this year's Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year, and I have had the great privilege of getting to know Corey through this process. She's been a friend, a mentor, an encourager, and it was just something I couldn't wait to share with everybody here that she wrote a book. You've probably heard me talk a lot about it. You've probably heard a lot about it if you're in the military spouse world. And I wanted to have this opportunity to share that with you because when I read her words, it opened up my eyes to a lot of stuff about my marriage, things that I maybe took for granted or things I didn't even realize that were going on. And I'm just so excited. If you haven't read Corey's book, I really want to encourage you to read it. And even if you haven't read it at all, tonight is going to open your eyes anyway. And it might encourage you to run out and grab a copy and encourage your spouse to read it too because it's applicable to both sides of the marriage. On that note, I'm going to turn it over to Corey. She's going to talk a lot more about it, and I can't wait to get started with you guys tonight. So I am Corey. I'm so excited that um, I'm joining with you guys tonight um, just, just to have girl time and just adult time, like MJ was saying, and just the opportunity to just talk. And um, so the book came from um, a trip that I had the opportunity to go to in December, last December, right, right before Christmas, I got to go overseas and visit um, some deployment locations. Um, and I, it was a one week whirlwind trip, really, with the Secretary of Defense, where I visited Iraq and Afghanistan and Turkey and two aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf. So I, I think part of the goal was to see all the different branches as well as um, joining with the Secretary of Defense in his efforts to thank the troops. Um, and of course, he was doing a lot of foreign policy during all of that, but my goal for the trip, for the Secretary of Defense's office, what their goal was with Military Spouse Magazine and me, was to basically report on what I found seeing these deployment locations and having the opportunity to see as a military spouse that's not active duty, what it was like in these and to answer all these questions that we all have and just assume that we'll never have answers to them um, and assume that we'll never understand them. What I didn't anticipate was that during that trip um, I would actually learn a lot more about what it means to be a military spouse. I was able to see a lot of things through my spouse's eyes through um, by putting myself in his boots per se. <laughs> And, um, and it actually caused a lot of healing within me and in my marriage and also set me on a path to being more intentional in my marriage. And I know that's a very broad way of saying all that, so I think that tonight we'll unpack that a little bit more as far as um, how that came about. But I will say that um, the book was wonderful to write. Um, there was just too much for me to be taking in throughout that week to not write a book about it. And, um, and share what I was learning because I knew it was something that military spouses needed to hear. It was a lot of things that I knew military spouses were struggling with because I'd hear them in my counseling office talking about the, their struggles and um, maybe afraid to say it out loud. So I wanted to give voice to that. 
Um, but more importantly, I just really wanted to validate the experience of spouses and veterans and, and service members. And so hopefully we'll get into some really fun questions, get into some um, talking about how it can impact your life, um, how it can impact your marriage, and what it's also doing for other marriages who have already read it. So I'm super excited. That is, no, that is awesome. Actually, I was just wondering, like, if you had planned, like, ahead of time or maybe during that, like, when did you figure out you were going to write it? Because I don't know, sometimes I just want to be like, my, I'm sorry, military life, anybody's military life would be a bestseller. Every individual story would be a bestseller. Because sometimes it's just so ridiculous that it's just, you know, comedic relief. And then on the other times it's just so, oh, so heart triumphy and you know it would be best sellers across the board but of course I never put pen to paper outside of you know writing for the magazine because I'm ADD um, so when did you decide to just when did was it a need did you just need to do it so first of all I'm going to coin and take the the term um, triumphy I think that that should leave with us this evening and it should be, <laughs> you should get royalty for triumphy. Um, no, I think, um, you know, the first time I realized that there was really something that was going to come out of this was right, bef right actually before we PCS. We were actually in the process of PCSing and packing up the house when I got word that I was going to get to go on the trip. And um, I was having all these feelings and nervousness about leaving for the trip and going overseas and leaving my children. and. You know, just I was so nervous, but I felt so excited to go to that I, um, I, I suddenly, well, my husband sat me down and said, if you're going to do this for spouses, if you're going to write about the deployment experience for spouses, then you need to take note right now because this push and pull that you're experiencing about wanting to go and wanting to stay, um, this is the soldier's experience. And so you need to pay attention to that and pay attention to what's happening inside of you. So at that point is where I wrote a blog about it, and I thought, you know what, this is going to just turn into maybe a blog journey. Um, but it wasn't until I was on the C-17 um, when I was talking with the pilots of the C-17, um, and they were opening up with me about their marriage, and they were talking about how this mission with the SECDEF, um, obviously a very important mission for them, was a no-fail mission, which meant that everybody had to do what they needed to do to make the mission succeed and that that was priority and that they really wished that their family members understood that more because they took such pride in it and they were so excited about um, completing a mission and having it be a no-fail mission and the satisfaction of doing that um, that I realized in that moment that our marriages need to be a no-fail mission too. And so I visited with them in the cockpit and I came back down and I sat down and I started writing every sensory piece of information that was coming in at me like what did what did the C17 smell like what did it look like what did you know I, I thought about my husband telling stories about being in a C17 and what he experienced there and I suddenly found myself back in time where he was and I started to see his life through his eyes in times that I had not experienced it before so that was the moment that I realized there was so much information flooding in at me, there was no way to just do a blog on it. Okay. So, Corey, I know this has had a lot of positive impact on military marriages. Do you think this is a book that applies to marriages outside of the military lifestyle? Absolutely, yes. In fact, um, I was doing an online coaching session with a first responder family today, um, a police officer family. And, you know, and for, maybe I need to say before we go further, what is a sacred space? Because sacred spaces sounds like a religious term. And for those out there that know that I'm a chaplain's wife, it's very easy to think this is going to be an overly spiritual book. And sacred spaces is actually a phrase that my husband and I defined as. Um, sacred meaning set apart, meaning there's these significant life-changing moments that happen in your life that are multi-sensory. That could be like when we have a child, right? It changes our life. It's significant. It's a multi-sensory experience. It's, it's something that we easily remember what we saw and remember what we felt, and it's a life-changing moment. Um, but it's something that's hard to describe to other people as well. And so um, we, my husband and I started using the word sacred spaces or the phrase sacred spaces to 
tell each other, hey, this was a significant moment in my life that, and we experienced it separately. He experienced some very sacred moments in his life during deployment that I will never understand. And I experienced some sacred moments with some of our military spouse community that he would never understand. And um, so as I was working with this first responder family today, there was some definite sacred spaces that they were going through even individually of things that he had experienced at work that she couldn't understand and that she, he was needing her to tread lightly when they would talk about these experiences. Um, just tonight, my husband shared with me an email that a family friend who is not a first responder or a military family read the book and they said, in some way, they wish that the title of the book didn't include military marriage, and they wish that it wasn't a, a military plane on the cover because every marriage should read this book. So I absolutely believe that everybody can get something out of this book because when it comes down to it, every single one of us, military or not, has had sacred, significant, set-apart moments in our life that have changed us forever. I like that you brought up that there are sacred spaces both on both sides of the fence. So you've got the service member who has their uh, defining moments when they're away from the family. And then on the other side, you have the spouse who's gone through her own things that are both sacred spaces. How do you, um, how do you recommend closing that gap when you've got husband and wife both kind of competing with their own sacred spaces that happen at the same time, but they're so drastically different to total opposite sides of the coin? Yeah, so this was the reason why I wanted to go on this journey in the first place, was recognizing that um, I wasn't satisfied, I wasn't content with the gaps that existed between my husband and I. I. I realized I had gotten to this complacent, apathetic place as a military spouse where I was like, you know what, I'm just never going to understand you. I'm just never going to understand that event. I'm just, that was your life then and I had something that you didn't understand either. And I suddenly was like, this is not okay. This is, not a, this is not what I envisioned marriage to look like. I want to know more. I want to be closer to you. I want to try to understand. And so the journey was what does it take to be intentional in pursuing his heart and, and actually trying to understand. And I realized that, yes, we will never fully understand these significant moments that we've experienced apart in military separations. There's no way that I can go and crawl in my husband's brain and see what he saw and experience what he experienced. But I realized that I could try and I realized that I had stopped trying and I, I realized that I could just actually sit and listen to him explain it and tell me the story and I know that's a whole other question of what if your service member won't share their stories but if I actually just listened to him share what his experience was like and I tried to leverage empathy in my heart and actually paid attention to what he was saying then my trying made so much more of a difference. So definitely I think it's about um, being empath empathic and I think it's also about recognizing that some, some you don't have to travel to the other side of the world to better your marriage. Sometimes it's just recognizing that some things that we can do with our spouse will help that create that understanding and close the gaps and sometimes it's recognizing that I can't be that person for my spouse sometimes all the time that may be a better place that's uh, with their battle buddies and I support that connection better so that he um, gets what he, he needs as far as his support as well. Well you know that actually that actually pretty much segues into my question which is okay so my question was always like what part does like our military community are you know not only the fellow warriors but our spouses too what what do they play in healing and like for me I, I'm gonna st I, I've said it in previous book clubs before and I have no problem saying it um, you know my husband serves in a different capacity where he has no he is not deployed so the way that I assist in healing is that I use you know I have a little bit more free time than some other spouses do, so I use that time to become a resource for them. That's the only way that I've ever felt like I could be a healing product, but what can the rest of our community do to be part of that process? Are you saying what can our military spouse community be part of the process of healing marriages or service members or, or what kind of healing are you asking? Alasha, are you still there? You still there? Still there? Yes, I am. Okay. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Um, um, no, no. So what actually, we... yeah, actually, actually, I think I know what you're asking, um, and I think that that is there's lots of 
on one level, I think we have military leaders who can do what um, a little bit of what I got to experience on that journey. Military, military leaders can do that for our families. And that means, you know, we used to do that. We used to be, we'd have family day. You know, we'd have org day where military leaders would set out the helicopters and the jets and the tanks and, and kids would get to crawl inside and smell what it's like to be in a, an Apache helicopter and sit in the cockpit and push buttons that, you know, the hel helicopter's not on, right? Or um, it's, it's this multi-sensory approach because that's where what I did during the trip was I paid attention to all five of my senses in order to secure a memory that I would never forget. If our most significant memories and our most traumatic memories are stored in our brains through our five senses and the way and the way that our chemical process works in our brain, if that's actually how we end up struggling with PTSD as well, so that when we're triggered of a traumatic thought, then we immediately all of our our senses refire in our brain and take us back to that moment. Then I wanted to secure this memory and never forget it. I didn't want to leave this trip and ever forget what it was like to understand my spouse better. And so military leaders can do this. They can create these multi-sensory events for these families that don't get a chance to go to Afghanistan, can go and sit in a tank and smell it or feel it rumble or and experience some of what our service members experience so that when they come home and they say, I mean, even last week, my husband, we were driving behind a truck, and it was a diesel truck, and he could smell the diesel, and he was like, I love the smell of diesel. It just takes me back to this wonderful place. And I knew exactly what he meant, because when I was sitting in that MH-53 helicopter, and we were flying over the Persian Gulf, by that point on the fourth, fifth day, I was beginning to love the smell of diesel, because it was the smell of adventure. And I understood it in that moment. And it didn't take going to Afghanistan. That's something that our military leaders can do as well. Otherwise, I would say, oh, yeah, did somebody want to say something? Okay, I heard oh. a noise there for a second. No, I was just going to say that I've been fortunate enough to participate in family days, like Jane Wayne Day, and we <gasps> put on Jane! cats for kids. Jane, yeah, Jane knows what I'm talking about. Ah! <laughs> Love it. Yeah. In the Marine Corps, we had a lot of opportunities in 29 Palms because we're in the middle of the desert. You know, we've got to create stuff for ourselves to do. So the leadership was really hands-on with that. With back-to-back -back deployments, we got to go in the simulators and we got to use the tr same training modules that our Marines were using to train for these deployments. But when the leadership isn't exactly there, when they can't provide those experiences, is there something you think our military uh, families, like our spouses and stuff, can do to help uh, alleviate? some of these burdens when we are trying to close those gaps with sacred spaces? So I think that's a really good question because um, we can't always rely on leadership to fix everything, right? And if we do, then we're going to be very frustrated for a very long time. And so I think being proactive to, number one, take care of our own marriages, pursue our own spouse's heart is crucial. And then I think that one thing that we do really well as a military community is supporting each other's marriages as well. Especially if there, um, if there's these significant events that we've gone through and experienced together, like so many military spouses, there's wonderful stories of our community and how we like have these wonderful times where we need each other to survive, and 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 we also should be championing each other's marriage. We should also be championing our friends that we have grown very close to to say, hey, what are you doing to pursue your spouse's heart? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you um, listening to them when they feel frustrated that their spouse isn't opening up to them yet? Um, I think that as a spouse, I think that one of the best things that we can do is, is recognize that one way we can close the gap is by listening and, and um, really not worrying about the misunderstandings, like mis clear up those misunderstandings. Sometimes gaps just happen because there's a misunderstanding of the day, right? So that's one gap that we can close. Another gap is, is realizing that, you know, it might be something that's happening in my heart and I need to pursue my spouse's heart and I've just grown resentful and apathetic and um, kind of in my corner of the boxing ring waiting for him to go first. Like, it's his turn. I've done all the work. And that we need to always be taking a step forward. That's what marriage is. And then finally, I think, um, other than professional help, which is a huge topic, um, is recognizing that who do I need to be for my spouse? 
so that they feel that they can be vulnerable enough to share their sacred spaces with me. And asking that, that's okay to ask your spouse, who can I be in your life that would make you feel safe and comfortable so that you could open up about this over time? And that being okay with them sometimes saying, you know, um, I really need to talk with my guys that were there in that moment. Um, only they understand it. And it's my job then to create the room and space for them to go and have those phone calls and really respect and guard that time and protect that time so that they have that connection and they come back to me, he comes back to me, um, feeling restored, feeling connected, feeling safe, and feeling understood. You know, I'm gonna, I'm going to stray from the script just a tad on this next one. Um, <laughs> I'm full of surprises, aren't I? Um, so, you're a counselor, you're a licensed counselor, um, and I'm assuming since your husband is a chaplain, he is also has that train, the same training. I'm wondering how that affects. I'm wondering how that affects a marriage. I wonder how that affects. Like I wonder having all of that knowledge, especially being able to apply it to all of these under other couples, um, and helping and enriching their marriages. Does that ever get in the way in yours? Oh, that's such a good question. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, you know what, when my husband and I first got married, the first four years of our marriage were hell. And we talk about that at marriage retreats. I mean, we had the most difficult marriage ever <laughs> starting off. I think it was what a lot of people struggle with is expectations. I think we were trying to figure out our way and our jobs, and he wasn't in the military yet. He didn't know what he, his sense of purpose was. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to be a counselor, and so we really struggled a lot in the first few years. And, um, you know, we went to a counselor, and at that time we were already pretty good communicators, and we talked a lot, and, and the best advice that the counselor gave to us is that we needed to stop talking. Now, as a counselor, I'm usually the one that's trying to get people to communicate, but we were apparently overly communicating, and we still do to this day, and we will tend to accidentally we can t get up on a Saturday morning and process all of our junk until like noon if we, if we didn't have children that were like, please feed us. So <laughs> we definitely don't um, talk about each other's clients. You know, like if he's working with soldiers and I'm working with families, you know, we might talk about um, generalities of things that we're working through and trying to figure out what is the puzzle that we need to figure out. And we do also try to be very aware that when you're working with so many other people's stories, because stories like these, all these significant moments can be very traumatic and hard to hear, um, that they can tend to be sticky. So for example, if you've ever, like if your spouse has ever had a really rough day and they've come home and then you've had a great day and then they share with you their icky day and suddenly everybody feels icky. Right, so it can be kind of sticky sometimes. So we do our best to set really good boundaries if we know that we need to put business away and instead focus on us because it, it, you're right, it is a very, it's very easy for us to get caught up in all of that and want to solve the problems of the world. Tammy, um, Tammy, Tammy Meyer um, is asking, she actually said, hey Corey, can you talk about or give like an example of a, some positive uh, sacred spaces? Tammy, thank you for joining us. I love Tammy Meyer. So yeah, absolutely. So um, I, we rushed in through the definition of sacred spaces very, very quickly, and it can be very difficult for people to understand. So positive sacred spaces are, are just as powerful as negative ones, right? It's really easy to understand traumatic sacred spaces. Everybody gets something difficult happened, and it's hard for me to get over it. Um, positive sacred spaces are... You know, for me, I think, and from what I've heard from other people who've read the book, are those that are talking about, you know, these these moments during, like, the deployment where um, I spent Thanksgiving with my neighbor, my military spouse neighbor, and it was just such a special moment of just helping each other out. Um, and it's, it's a time of community, a time of connection. And when I think back to that time, like, I have this emotional flooding of just, happiness and connection and gratitude and and I feel so connected to that person so that you know having a child if it wasn't traumatic and it was a positive experience it was a multi-sensory obviously we felt it physically right but we also saw things and heard things and so when we think about birthing that child we, we are overcome with all of those senses all over again so there can also be spiritual moments that are multi-sensory so people who 
feel very close with God are going to have moments in their prayer life where they remember um, feeling especially connected spiritually in their life. That is a positive moment that felt very multi-sensory to them. So sacred spaces are really more about these set-apart moments that are significant in your life. And, you know, sometimes you can find a positive sacred space during a very challenging and difficult time. Like, you've gone through something very difficult, but then once you've kind of, time has passed, then you look back on it and you're like, actually, the memories that I have are, are memories of friends and connection and people served me and, and brought me food. And, and it ends up being a very powerful, positive memory, too. So I think the goal here is if we're going to experience so many significant sacred spaces apart from our spouse, what can we do to now ex be more purposeful and be more intentional at creating more shared sacred spaces together in our marriage to complement and counterbalance these moments that we're having apart so that we don't feel like our marriage is like these two independent lives that are just kind of existing. Instead, we're being more intentional about having these significant life-changing moments together um, and that makes it more powerful and more connected in our marriage. Speaking of sacred spaces on like the ones you're talking about, the positive ones, made me think of the sacred spaces Matt probably created well, when he was dealing with moving into a new home, taking the household goods, dealing with the kids, and you're laughing because it's usually a role that we would take on and we just take it for granted that's what we're going to do. And I feel like, you know, Matt being a chaplain, he's so compassionate and so understanding and that probably helped him a lot. But was there anything that you did or anything that you, you guys worked on together, talked about together before that role reversal happened that you think helped him step into your shoes? You know, he was trying to give me a lot of tips on things he wanted me to see while I was gone. Um, you know, I don't think that I talked with him much ahead of time because I, I made the assumption that because he's dad and he is home and he's experienced home and family and kids that it wasn't going to be too much of a role reversal for him. Um, I think that the role reversal, like we knew it was happening, especially right before I left when I was experiencing the push and pull of going. I remember being outside in the hotel parking lot and him... Um, processing with me the fact that he wasn't going to write me much information and he was just going to let me go and and that was he was trying to do for me what I think that I he would have liked for me to do for him um, but I think what he didn't anticipate was that you can't not communicate with your person on the other side of the world and he ended up like within 24 hours like a long email of everything that was going on and what the kids did and everything that we normally do as military spouses is updating them because we feel like they need to know and the truth was I did need to know and so I think the role reversal truly honestly on his part was a, a huge surprise and I think it was better that way because there was no way to fully prepare him I think he was dad and he thought he had this, right? I think he thought, how hard can this be? Um, until I'm in Afghanistan if I just, and he can't call really me. Really quick, just if I might intervene on that one, he, he, you know, of course, I got this. I got this, right? Um, because they're always good for dad. They're all, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's like that in your house, but it sure as heck is in mine. They are always good for dad. Did he, God bless him, did he experience the Murphy? Did he? Uh, let me think about that. Um, Murphy, oh man. Yeah, I think he did. I mean, I think, you know, our household goods were delivered on the day that I flew out. And so I think that, you know, we were hoping to, I think the original plan was for because it got pushed back. So anyways, the point was, I think he wasn't planning on leaving me. He was going to say goodbye to me and have this wonderful moment of goodbye, and instead he just had to leave me at Andrews Air Force Base for an extra 24 hours while he came home and had to deal with Murphy's Law, right? Deuces, yeah. And so I think he he didn't anticipate the move being as difficult by himself. My dad did come, help, come to help with that initially. 
But, you know, then, of course, he did start to get sick by the end of the week, and so then he was starting to get grumpy, and he was just not feeling well. And, you know, then I would call at these inopportune times because it was the only time I had access to a phone, which is so similar to deployment. And, you know, he was, like, trying to rush and try to figure out how do I have a phone call and parent and feed them at the same time, and the waiter needs the ticket, and and everybody's judging me because I'm on the phone and I'm, I'm attached to my phone, but it's the only time my wife can call. And... And it was just like this immense amount of pressure that I think he finally was like, oh, dear God, how do you be all of these people at once? And even to the point of, you know, I want to kick my kid out of the bed, but how, how do I kick my kid out of the bed when they feel like, where's mom and is she in danger, right? And so you end you up know, just letting them sleep there longer. So nothing that necessarily terrible, I don't think, happened in that particular week. But there was so much stress of the moving and unpacking that he ended up, I think, in some ways, overworking himself and self-sabotaged himself. Do you think that after you came back from this experience, has there been any change in his understanding of your role? Like, have you guys talked about it? Or, for instance, the um, incident where he was at IHOP. I love reading about that in your book because I remember my first deployment I experienced, I was pregnant with our first child, I was a waitress, and my phone rang while I'm taking someone's order, and I knew who it was. So I had to like, just, I'm sorry, guys, uh, my husband's calling from Iraq, and this only happens, like, you know? So <laughs> did he, was he more intuitive to the challenges that you would face or to the stress that you go through uh, dealing with everything on the spouse side after you return from this trip? Yeah, I think so. I, I definitely think that it, it shifted his perspective of how much we are juggling so many things at once. We had so many conversations afterwards, just, and we still do sometimes, processing it. Um, I, I also came back from this trip still trying to process some of the things that I experienced, and I'll, I'll talk to him and I'll say, is this kind of what that's like, or um, is this what you experienced with this jet lag? And, um, and I think there's also times that he... Um, has walked away understanding our role a little bit better as far as um, trying to accomplish everything at once, trying to be all things for all people, the stress of not having the connectivity and having to just make decisions. Like my favorite, one of my favorite parts as far as the role reversal, which he actually brought up this week, actually this is a great, uh, great um, answer to your question, was in the book I talk about one of the first aha moments of this role reversal was realizing that he picked out the wrong rug. I had picked out a rug and I took a picture of it from Ikea and I said, okay, when you go to Ikea, this is the rug that we want. And he got a different rug that he thought would match the furniture when I had gotten a rug that matches the painting. And so when I saw that and I was, you know, overseas and I saw this picture of this rug that he was so proud that he got. And I was just like, oh, how do I tell him it's the wrong rug? You know, and then I thought to myself, how many times have I had to make a decision that he would have made it differently, but he couldn't do anything about it? And so even this past week, he was like, so I'm thinking about going and getting the right rug, and then we can move the wrong rug to a different location, if that will make you feel better, so that I can make it right. And I told him, I said, you know what? We're going to keep the wrong rug, because it means more about the fact that we have to not nitpick and not have so much control over each other and we need to embrace the fact that you know we both did the best we could and I respect you for that and I appreciate the effort. A for effort. <laughs> yeah, A for effort on that one. I mean, wow. He picked out a rug. Hey, you got one up on me, man. You're good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My husband's a better decorator than I am and never will be. Um, <laughs> so, Brian has a question, and it's pretty fantabulous, actually. He said, um, hey, Corey, do you have any advice for spouses who met or married their service member well into their career, and how we can talk to them about those sacred spaces that occurred before we met? Yeah, I think that, oh, there's so many couples who have met after experiences have already happened, and by then, you know, these sacred spaces and significant moments are very much who they are, you know, and who you fell in love with, and who you um, chose to spend your life with, and and it's part of who they are. It's, it's that whole thing of it taking space in their story. So these significant moments are, are part of their story now, as part of who they are. And so I know that there's a lot of people out there who are very hesitant to share their sacred space stories. Maybe it's because 
they feel vulnerable, may, they feel like they're going to get emotional and that's a sign of weakness. Um, really this is, I, I think the best advice would be going to your spouse and we never demand, right? We never demand that they share those stories before they're ready. It's more of an invitation and it's more of setting the stage, if you will, for who do I need to be for you to feel like you can do that with me. And, and one way that you can do that is go to your spouse and say, I love who you are. I love the fact that I fell in love with you with all these stories. This whole narrative of who you are is who I fell in love with. And these particular sacred spaces of your stories have made you to be the amazing person that I love. It makes you um, more excited about life. It makes you perhaps more carpe diem, like seize the day, or I'm living life to the fullest. And, and all of those things I appreciate and love about you. And so I would love to hear those stories so that I can better understand your experiences, so that I can better respect you when they come up in your, in your life today or tomorrow. And so who do I need to be or what kind of setting do we need to have where you'd feel safe doing that? And then plan it. Plan a date night where you can sit down with your spouse and, and you both are prepared for this conversation. It's not something we spring on them. And um, men especially do great with knowing in advance that this is a conversation that's going to happen and I need to prepare myself for it. And so um, really telling them from a positive perspective of I love you because of these stories. Um, I love my own husband more now because of what he's gone through and the person he has become because of it. Even though it also introduces difficulty into our life sometimes, I also love who he's become through it. And um, sometimes some spouses, some marriages out there need to find the positive in that. Perhaps you're only feeling the difficulty, you're only feeling the stress, and it feels like only a negative. But really, um, maybe that would be a great place to actually start with your spouse, is to tell them, you know, out of these sacred spaces, what, how, how has your life changed and made you a better person? And maybe you start there before we get into the other stuff. It sounds like sometimes it can get challenging to open up and be very personal, even with your spouse, someone that you should be very comfortable with. So I can only imagine how it was for you to open up and be so personal with the world in your book. Was it hard to open up like that and be so vulnerable? <laughs> it was excruciating. I Actually, I think what was more excruciating was um, being vulnerable enough to say to my husband how much I realized when I came back from the trip how much I needed to change because really this was um, looking into the mirror of myself. Me, me putting myself in his shoes, really I did understand his experience but I saw myself through his eyes and I saw things that I could have done better, I saw things um, that I, I wish I would have known and, and rather than beating myself up with that, instead I decided to be more intentional and come home with a new mission to say, how can I do this better from this point forward? And um, that was the part that was, I th and still is to this day, excruciating to be humble and to be selfless and to be less selfish in my own life. And that is on a daily basis, very vulnerable and very excruciating at times when we, it's just easier and more comfortable to be selfish and say, I want what I want when I want it. Um, but as far as writing the book, it was hard. It was scary. Nobody wants to put your vulnerable stuff out there. In the book, I've got um, very personal emails that Matt sent me um, during two different deployments um, that kind of share our story and our marriage. Um, you know, but I think that what I've what I heard from military spouses in the clinical setting, as far as behind confidential doors, I needed to give voice to it somehow. I needed to give military spouses the courage to talk about what it's like on their side without feeling like they're going to get blasted for it or called unpatriotic because they might hold a feeling of excitement and pride in what their service member does and at the same time also have resentment that they need to deal with. And so I just decided to throw myself out there and be the guinea pig and say, I'll go first because we all know we're, we're feeling it. We all know that we're talking about it. But I'll be the first one to go, and hopefully if I'm the first one to go, then other stories will follow, and other people will have the courage to share their stories. And honestly, that has been my favorite thing of this whole book coming out, is people are starting to share their stories. 
and they're finding the freedom in, in talking about what they're feeling and talking with their spouse and then sharing that with other people and saying, and then we're all saying, me too, me too, me too. And then we're getting better and we're moving forward. And so honestly, it's all been worth it. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I love that you talk about resentment because after reading your book, I realized that I too am guilty as charged. I, I remember the time that they stopped in Australia for three or four days or Hawaii in a couple of days. And I'm thinking, wow, I wish I could go to Australia. I wish I could go to Hawaii. And on the flip side, I would think he's missing Christmas. And then in your book, I read the part about how they just this is just another day that's not even a concern to the people that are mission focused. Like they're not trying to set up a Christmas tree and put up their decorations. It's just another day. So the things that I thought were important might not be important to the service member in that situation. And on the flip side, the things that I was harboring resentment for might be jealous of. After reading your book and reading um, some personal accounts of people that you've talked to, I was like, wow, that was really selfish of me, and I need to own that and stop. <laughs> so from your perspective, because you've had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, what can you tell spouses that deployment is like? Um, wow, resentment, man, is such a big issue, and and I had to deal with my own. I really did. I didn't even realize how deep it went. Um, and my personal resentment was a lot about um, I didn't like the fact that my husband came home different from deployment, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go through something traumatic. It means they experience things that we didn't get to experience and then they're different from that and and sometimes that causes difficulty and or jealousy and I, man the number of times that I've been like I want to go somewhere exciting like I want to just up and leave and pack a bag and like go have some fun and he's like sure I'll just give you a cot and a bug net and we'll see how you enjoy it but um no, I, I had my own I had my own struggle with that as well. And um, sure, this was a great adventure, and it scratched that itch a little bit. And I got to say, see, I got to do that too. Um, but I think really more than anything, um, I saw the branches working together, which was unbelievable. We never get we rarely as military spouses get to see branches work together. It's like I know a little bit about what the Marines do, but I don't know much about what. Natasha's life is like as a Marine spouse or um, you mentioned Tammy Meyer as a Navy spouse like I know what the Navy does but I'm not really sure what the Navy life is like right but to see the branches actually work together was remarkable to in one day for one event one days of a set of events to happen to pretty much see every single branch throughout the day working kinda hand in hand to make that mission possible something we never get to see and so there was such satisfaction for them. There was a joy and a spark in their eyes that we don't get to see back at home because when they're home, they're training or they're in a cubicle or in an office setting. But when they're deployed, they're doing what they've been training to do and there's this fulfillment and we miss out on that. And I didn't realize they didn't, I mean, sure, they wanted to be home with their family at Christmas. They had, some of them were missing the birth of their children and there's definitely that tug to be at home, but there's also this wonderful fulfillment that they're experiencing too. And so I came home realizing, wow, I will never, um, you know, when my husband, if he ever had the courage to say that he's looking forward to deployment, I will never feel hurt by that again because I know that he can hold both of those in, in both hands and that he can enjoy both things and that I can release him to go and do what it is that he loves to do and that's a wonderful way of supporting him. Um, otherwise, definitely a colorless place. Definitely, um, they, had, they had everything that they need, needed and yet there was nothing there. And, and there really was this mentality of, you know what, we don't need, I mean it's obvious when we say, it'd be like saying let's send cowboy boots. To, to Afghanistan and they're like well, what do I need cowboy boots for and so it's almost like they shut their brain off to any ex excess of anything extra that they might need because there's really no point and then they grow in their ability to be content with what they have and that includes the community around them so it was an extremely eye-opening experience for me a little segue on that just like 
service members grow content with what they have. I feel like sometimes spouses can do that as well. On the home front, we go we grow content with that absence. We sometimes might have a self-fulfillment of, I can do this, I can do it on my own. And I think that might create a change in the spouse as well that the service member has to come home to. Have you ever experienced or dealt with anyone experiencing on the service member side that they're not happy with who their spouse has become in their absence because of those types of experiences? So like the service member coming home and the spouse having grown maybe um, overly controlling or independent, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, yeah. the oh, 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 yeah. Left out. My car, left out. my house, my, house, my remote, remote, my bed, my, bed, my kids, my unless kids, they're bad, they're yours. Bad yours. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, actually, I think most, oh, I better not say most, a lot of service members um, talk about wanting to come home and find their place and realizing that it, they're not entitled even though they kind of should feel entitled that it's their home and their family and whatever but it's easy for them to come home and, and just want to jump right in but most of them recognize that there's going to be that transition because they need that time and space because they haven't been a dad for like three months a year or whatever and so they, they need that transition um, but I think that a lot of service members come home and realize that they don't feel needed anymore, that their spouse ha has done a great job running the household and finding that battle rhythm and being very independent in their decision making. And one of the greatest needs, just to stereotype here for a second, um, one of the greatest needs of men is to feel needed and to feel like they have a role. And so um, as much as it's difficult to give away that control and let go of our independence, um, it's really important that not just men, but it tends to be um, higher in men, but that our spouse feels needed when they come home. And so just because you can hang those curtains doesn't mean you have to, right? Just because you know how to doesn't mean you can't hand it to them and say, hey, I know I could but if you'd like to help me out this is something that you can do and of course they may say no nope, I got you go for it <laughs> I don't want to hang your curtains <laughs> but you know they need to feel like there is a role in a place and it's not a matter of can they do it or you can't do it it's a matter of releasing some of that again and um, not allowing that to fester in your heart and push them away in your heart because that's usually what ends up happening Who's next? Are you there? Is I'm here. There? Yes. Okay. Tasha, are you still on? Yes. Okay. I've got my microphone got my situated. Ah. There we go. All right. Thank you for that. Sorry about that, Corey. I was trying to figure out the mic situation. <laughs> IT is not my expertise. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think sometimes having that release is something that personally I struggle with and you're talking about intentions and I know as being part of your launch team you sent out challenge cards and one of my intentional things was to um, at least praise my husband once a day because like you said they feel the need to um, be appreciated, be needed and that was one of the things that we challenged with a lot was that he needed to know that I needed him even though I know that I could be self-sufficient. I did it for, you know, nine months to a year while he was gone. But the fact, like you said, that just because I could doesn't mean I should have to every time. So that's something definitely to keep in mind, I think, for not just military marriages, but all marriages, because there needs to be a need for each other in that. Yeah, and that you brought up a really great point, is that I didn't want to, how many times have we read a really great book and then we were like, gee, that was great. And then, you know, we put it aside and we move on to the next book. And it was really important for me that if I was going to go through such an overhaul in my life and in my marriage, that I bring a call to action to other marriages. And so um, what I've invited couples to do or what I've invited spouses to do is for you to read the book and go on this journey yourself. I, the book is a lot about bringing you along on this journey of my heart change um, not just the journey overseas, but my heart changed, my marriage changed, this process that I went through. And so I invite, invite you in, in a very vulnerable way to be part of um, me going through this gutting like a fish and rebuilding myself. And the call to action behind that is now what can you do 
to now be intentional in your own marriage. And it doesn't have to be an overhaul. It can be something very simple. One of my favorite phrases is simply start, but start simple. Like just do something small. And so the call to action with Sacred Spaces is um, choose one thing um, that you can be intentional daily with. What's one thing, maybe you've been wanting to do a date night and you've been talking about it but you haven't done it, you haven't gotten a babysitter or maybe it's you do need counseling and you just need to follow through with that. Maybe it's something that, like Natasha said where it's a heart change in your heart where you say, you know what, I need to be more positive, I need to speak more kindly to my spouse or something that's a small action every day. And then find a way to remind yourself to do that a little bit every single day. And so. On my website, under Sacred Spaces, it's just coreyweathers.com. I give you a free PDF that you can print out. It's what's and then the, it's what Natasha is talking about, where it's a um, it's a card, it's a commitment card, where you can say it walks you through what is it that you're going to do to be intentional for how many days are you going to try this and what change are you hoping to see in your marriage and then you just put that on your bathroom mirror or on your refrigerator as a daily reminder of what can I do to. Um, be more intentional in my marriage. Um, and so it's a call to action. And so I'm inviting you guys to be a part of that just so we can make these small changes in our relationships. So I see MJ has her husband there. So he's going to be, I think, our guinea pig as far as a service member. And, um, and so, Natasha, I want you to think, because I know we're almost out of time, I want you to think of a question especially based off of you've read Sacred Spaces, you've read about the service members experience. And so poor Chris, <laughs> he's so, been so, yeah, invited so, into this class. So Chris. Corey and Natasha, this is my husband Chris. He's already heard a ton about you and it's probably nice to see faces to the names. Please don't forget them. You probably won't. I'll pull it up on YouTube if you forget. Um, but please, go ahead. Hi Chris, thanks for joining us and being a willing participant. Or is he a willing participant? <laughs> he is today. He is as okay. far as this is going. <laughs> that was the payment. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll, uh, you want to ask the first question or do you want me to? Go ahead. No, you jump in. Okay, so Chris, I, I have a question for you. So the process of me going overseas and or just even experiencing the service member's perspective is, is a lot of... I really got to experience the joy and the satisfaction of doing something that you really love to do and feeling a calling to do it. And so um, what I guess my question for you would be how important is it to you that MJ understands what it is that you love to do and why you love to do that job? Uh, it's very important. I mean you have to be a team in order for it to be successful and uh, it if you don't have support at home, then you really can't focus on what you're supposed to be doing. So whether you're overseas or at home, uh, at your home base, uh, going home and having a supportive family and doing what we need to do is extremely important. At home, do you find it easier to share your experiences with MJ and talk about those sacred spaces that we've been discussing, or is it better that MJ is a supportive person, as in allowing you to have the time that you need to share those experiences with your battle buddies or other people that might have walked that with you? Well, both are important. I mean, you have to have people. I mean, everybody needs people, whether it's you want to be with your family or if you want to be with your battle buddies. Having somebody that understands that no one person is more important than everyone else, obviously she's the most important person in my life. That's what's up. Perfect but answer. You absolutely need other people with shared experience that maybe your family might not quite understand, but they're willing to listen. So, equal importance. Do you feel like sharing those experiences and talking about them with your significant other that even though she's not there with you, do you think on from a personal perspective that she has the capacity to have enough empathy to feel as if she almost fully understands what you went through? Absolutely. There, She has a lot of experience in this. Now, when we first got married, it, it was a little bit of a different story, of course, just like it is for everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, any marriage would go through that regardless of whether you're in the military or not, but I mean, experience is the most important thing, and she understands how things work now and how I work and what I do at work, and now uh, everything's great. 
what about flipping that around on the home side? Have you ever had to step into her role and be the one-stop shop Mr. Dad and know what she goes through on the spouse front? Okay, I'm just going to interject here and give Chris some mad props and go ahead and say um, this man is like a one-stop shop because I can't cook. Write it down. I never will be able to. I try. I fail. I don't care. If we if he don't cook, we don't eat. We don't eat um, unless we got pampered chef gear around or something. So he, I mean, like, it's not a 50-50 thing. If I'm in school and I'm doing a semester and I'm busting my butt at work and with magazine and at school, he knows he's got to pick it up. And vice versa. If he's gone or if he's got extra work to do, I got it. You know what I mean? It's just picking up where he, and he's never, ever, even when we were younger, had a problem with it. So that's cool. Um, I like to cook because I like to eat. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, That's just going to be true. Do you have any, my last question will be, do you have any um, advice for other uh, service members who might find it challenging to step up into that role to be as supportive for the spouse? Because, like I said, that's a little too good there. <laughs> Are you sure we didn't script that answer in, right? I swear to God. <laughs> I swear hand to God. I would, I would say empathy is the most important thing. Um, seeing your spouse struggle or needing her time or her space or his time or his space, depending on your situation. Um, putting yourself in that role, you know that you need help sometimes whether you ask for it or not. If you were left on an island and didn't have that, how would you feel if that was reversed? Now your wife needs help, you have to help them. If you don't, then you're a jackass. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I love you. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Thank you, boo. <laughs> I love that. Um, Christina, no, Melissa had a question before we head out. Um, she wanted to know how do you keep your own negative sacred spaces from impacting your relationship in a negative way? In a negative way. Yeah, I think this is a great, great question for us to end on, and that is that every single one of us has had a negative experience in our life. Um, that can creep up and thank you Chris um, that can um, creep up and can trigger us and can cause us to act in all kinds of strange and weird ways like how many times have you had the same argument over and over and over with your spouse and then they then they say it and it triggers you again and you just start acting like a, a fool because you're just triggered that way right and so all of us have had negative experiences or sacred spaces in our past that can be triggered and so I think a great answer to this question, it may not be the way that Melissa wants me to answer it, but that is that professional counseling is sometimes very needed for us to process the negative, um, traumatic, or difficult sacred spaces in our lives. Um, more so because we need that outside person to help us see how are we being triggered and how are we bringing it into our relationship and there's sometimes a lot of things we bring into our relationship we don't even realize it's connected to that sacred space until somebody points it out and then we can start looking at it and we can start being aware of it and we can start putting some new tools and skills in place and so we can actually stop ourselves and hit a pause button and then maybe decide to do something different instead of the negative thing that we're always used to doing. So um, I think the best answer to that is get professional help if you can. Journaling is especially important. Talking with a friend also is, is really important too to help you have more awareness and, and be more intentional. That's a great challenge to be more intentional to not do that and be aware of it. I absolutely agree. And I'm going to be more intentional. Be more intentional. I love you, husband. Love you, husband. Um. <laughs> well, can I end this with, with a call to action for everybody? Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So wh what I would like for, to do is if you don't know what you can be intentional in, and it's something that you need to, to think about, I would really like to return and challenge you guys to create more shared sacred spaces together. Find some significant, fun things that you and your spouse can go do. Go try dancing lessons. Go try something you would never do before. Have it be a multi-sensory, um, significant, life-changing experience that's positive that you guys do together that can revolutionize your marriage and you can start recreating these wonderful memories in your relationship. 
And yes, I'm going to say what everybody else is thinking, that yes, sex is definitely a shared sacred space. <laughs> so, <laughs> and one that I'm sure your spouses and service members would greatly appreciate you creating more shared sacred spaces for. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. On mute. I will tell yeah. you, Corey, and everyone else, that this instance today with my husband joining me on this um, was a sacred space for us um, because we rarely get to actually intermingle our, our our work lives, and it was fantastic. So I am going to take that call to action to heart. Um, and I really appreciate you coming on because it, it, the book is fantastic. Everybody needs to go out and get it right now. Stat, Prano, Kindle, I don't care what it is. Go get it now. Um, and there will be a link in the YouTube um, stream. We'll get that on right away. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Natasha. You rock. Hoorah, yuck, kill, semper fi. And, um, and thank you for joining us at our Military Spouse Book Club. Night, thank you everyone. guys for having me. Good night. Thank you guys. Good night.